In this episode of Picking Winners, we're going to be talking about the ROI of America. We're going to um, do a little bit of a deep dive on a case study of an investment strategy that I'm executing right now and kind of get into the weeds a little bit and show you the nuts and bolts of that. And then we're going to talk about what cities in America are on their way to becoming the next big uh, investment cities in the country. So we're going to go forward in time and try to forecast which are the big markets that are about to pop. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Greg Rand. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Renner's Warehouse. And uh, we are America's leading property management company for single family investors. And we have some uh, new additions to our product line, uh, namely that we now uh, help people buy and sell rental property and build portfolios. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that all came to pass um, over the next 25 or 30 minutes or so. Um, and uh, first, I want to just tell you the reason why we do this on Fridays is that I'm cheating a little bit. I love the idea of, I, I figure that people are generally in the best mood of the week right about now. I'm not sure. I'm looking up on this, another screen here. We got a lot of people from a lot of places, I think. Although we didn't ask you to tell us where you're coming from when you register, I don't believe. So I don't know for sure. But usually we get them from all over the place. But on the East Coast where I am, um, it's 3 o'clock. So the week is winding to a close shortly. And... Um, so people tend to be in a good mood. It's a beautiful summer weekend coming up, hopefully, where you are. And uh, if I can get you to associate the way you feel right now with me, then I'm, I won already. So uh, we're excited to, uh, to talk with you about picking winners. This is a specialization of mine personally and of, of our companies. I'll give you a 30-second background on what got me here and why Renner's Warehouse is doing what it's doing. So 10 years ago, I started a company called Own America. Gives you an idea of what I think investing in real estate is really, really all about. What's really going on when you buy property in America is that you're owning America. Um, and my big idea was that the investment, well, the, the, the housing crash was going to give way to an investment boom. As a matter of fact, I wrote a book about that called Crash Boom. So it gives you an idea. This was written back in 2010. And it was all about how everybody's losing their heads about the housing crisis. I get it. It wasn't any fun. But there was going to be an investment boom on the other side of it. And I believe that. So 10 years ago, I started the company around building a national capability to service investors in the housing market because I believe there'd be a housing boom on the other side. At the same time, 1,500 miles away, a group of people were building a company um, called Renters Warehouse. And that company was all about, hey, there's a housing crisis going on and the market's going to recover and people should keep their homes. If you're underwater on your house, then don't sell it in a down market because after all, it's the housing market in the great U.S. of A. So, or was, as Bora would say, the U.S. and A. Um, <laughs> you guys are supposed to be laughing at that. I've got a video crew in here. I give you a Borat reference, <laughs> crying out loud. It's the last Borat reference I'm going to give you today. So it's housing in America. It's going to come back. Don't sell your house and take a loss. Just hang on to it. And the way you can hang on to it if you need it to move is to rent it out. And so different parts of the country, one in New York, one in Minnesota, um, and two different answers to the housing crisis, both of which had a common belief that an in, a, a real estate recovery was on the way. And of course it came. Um, a lot of people look back now and say, well, of course it was going to come. But I can tell you, I got laughed out of the room by 11 publishers in a row when I tried to write that book, Crash Boom, because they said that's idiotic. The housing meltdown may be permanent. They didn't want to have their name on a book that predicted a recovery. Um, so number 12 said yes. Anyway, long story short, after 10 years, uh, during that period of time, Own America, my business, was focused on working with Wall Street investors. Right, so big Wall Street money started getting into the housing market during this same period of time. And we were servicing them uh, while Renner's Warehouse was mainly servicing small investors, people that were keeping their home or buying one or two or three rental properties. Well, I got to know those guys. They got to know us because um, we travel in some of the same circles. And then last year, we got together and, and had this vision of a full service real estate investment company. Right, a property management company as the foundation upon which we could build and now have built a real estate brokerage company. So a company of real estate brokers that 
sell homes, but we don't specialize in people that are going to buy the home and live in it. We actually specialize in people that are going to buy the home and rent it out, and somebody else is going to live in it. So, um, real estate company built on top of a property management company and a real estate investment portal built on top of all of that. So, a vertically integrated real estate investment firm uh, that's kind of like best way to think of it is sort of like where um, Charles Schwab and Remax collide, right? A real estate company, but an investment company. A wealth management company, but that sells real estate rather than stocks and mutual funds. So that's what we are. Uh, and it's very cool because we have a lot of uh, appreciation for real estate investors. We think that you know, some stats for you um, that you might find interesting. Of the five or six million houses that are bought in this country every year, a million of them, a full 20%, give or take, a million of them are investors buying the house. So it's a big market segment that doesn't have an industry servicing it. And real estate investing is hard. Like I, I did surveys early on when I started the company asking people, do you believe in investing in the housing market? And the answer was universally yes to the people that responded. Um, are you doing it? Most people that believed in it weren't doing it. We'd ask them, why aren't you doing it? And the answers were, sometimes they were, we don't have any money. Well, that's a tough one. But I don't know how. I can't figure out how. And property management scares me to death. And so the idea that real estate investing is hard and yet a million properties a year get bought by mostly small investors. There's 16 million rental properties in America. There's a lot of people that are passionate about this asset class and are willing to tough it out. Right? They're willing to do it the hard way because it's the only way to do it until now. So our mission is out of love and appreciation for real estate investors. We're focusing all of our energy in developing technology and tools and people so that you can do research online, plan your strategy uh, by researching. And I'm going to jump into that in a second, by the way. Researching markets, begin to understand the way the national marketplace plays out. Um, and then begin a relationship with a real estate broker who is an investment specialist and then execute your plan by buying property and then hand the keys over to us and we'll deal with getting it rented out, collecting your rents, doing your maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's a beautiful thing. And so I'm happy you're here. Thanks for coming here. And I'm going to share sort of my personal specialty over the last several years has been picking the markets for the big Wall Street firms or helping them pick the markets. So we got you could say mastery over the data that um, the, the data around people trends, right? Population trends, my migration patterns around the country, employment trends, quality of life, cost of living factors, all the things that cause people, if they live somewhere, to stay there, and if they live someplace else and they move, why do they go there? Like, where are people moving to? Why are they doing that? Is that likely to continue? Um, if it is, if you could read the people trend, we call it, you know, we call it people watching to be cute, but, but that's what it is. It's trying to understand the population trends. Why are people doing what they're doing? Can we bank on that happening and continuing into the future? And if that is going to happen, where can we invest to get out ahead of the population growth and generate the best return on investment? Because that's what it's all about, right? We want people to be able to invest easily and then get a great ROI. And what's amazing about real estate is that nobody, really nobody until now, has ever revealed the ROI of residential real estate in America. They haven't had the data, and, or, they ha or they just haven't had the interest in revealing that ROI. So, so many investors that I know, um, if you ask them what kind of return they get on their rental property, they say 350 a month. They don't know what that is reflected as a percentage of what they invested. So they know their stock, portfolio got them 14%, 5%, minus 14%. They know that because a statement comes in the mail, but they don't know what the ROI is on their real estate investment. And so I'm going to skip to the punchline and then I'll, give, I'll, I'll fill in the blanks. What is the ROI of America? It's about 8 to 10% without breaking a sweat, meaning the face value ROI. When I say America, I mean you're buying houses in this country. That's what investing in the housing market is. So you're literally placing a bet that the prosperity and safety and freedom that is present in this country is going to continue. You recognize the fact that as products go, this is the best product ever invented in all of human history. Like it's better than the wheel, 
<laughs> it's better than the iPhone. Um, it is the most in-demand product ever conceived uh, because it's tapped into human nature. And listen, we, we have our, we have the wrinkles, we have, we have problems in this country, but compared to other countries, we're, we really are a free country. Um, and we really are generally a fair country and it is the best place to, uh, to live and thrive and raise a family and fend for yourself and be an independent person, self-reliant person. It's all those things and the world knows it. So the world wants to come here and once you're here, you don't tend to leave. You know, even every, every four years when we have a presidential election, there's always some celebrity that says, well, if that person wins, I'm out of here. And what happens? That person wins and they never leave. So um, nobody leaves. So what's the point? The point is um, the ROI of America Again, the house being the instrument through which you own the country. Or I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. Charlotte is the investment. Or I'm in Mooresville, North Carolina. That's inside of the Charlotte area. Mooresville is the investment. The house is the instrument through which you invest in Mooresville. Does that make sense? Like if I buy a share of stock, the share, the piece of paper is not the investment. The company is what I'm investing in. The share is the instrument. Well, the town, the state, the, ca the country, that's the investment. Uh, the, the house is just the instrument. That's the philosophy, all right? So what makes up ROI, and the reason why I say it's 8 to 10%, there are places you can do less than that. There are places you can do more than that. But on average, it winds up being 8 to 10%. And that 8 to 10% comes in the form of two things. The yield that you earn in terms of income and the, uh, the appreciation the, the value of the property that goes up over time and how much you're able to get in that regard. So just to kind of lay that out and give you some basic, as a matter of fact, you know what? I've got a spreadsheet. All right, so I'm gonna give you just a simple example then I'm gonna show you some technology where you can do this stuff much better than, than with a spreadsheet. And this is just a simple, a simple spreadsheet that helps to reflect ROI, all right? So if I have an example of a property that is worth $200,000, and I just bought one of these, I just bought two of these actually. So this is a real example. That property at $200,000 rents for $1,500 a month. And so that would then be $18,000 a year. And there's a metric called gross yield. See this right here, gross yield, 9%. That's you taking the $18,000 of gross rent that you'll be collecting and divide it by the price of the property. And so $18,000 is 9% of $200,000. So you have a 9% gross shield. Now, that's wonderful, but that's not ROI, right? And interestingly, I can make this point right now real quick. There are people, here's an article that came out just a couple days ago. Um, return on rentals, single family markets to pursue and avoid for maximum profit. And it's based upon data that talks about single family rental returns by county but here's the problem, and I love the people who wrote this. I, I, I know them, and I love the data company that they got the data from. But Gross Shield is not your return on investment. Gross Shield is a, is a key performance index. It's a way to compare two properties side by side, but in no way, shape, or form should that be considered what your return is. Because you're not making $18,000 because you haven't paid your taxes yet, right? You haven't paid your insurance yet. You haven't maintained the property yet. You haven't paid your HOA fees if it has one of those things, all right? You haven't paid a property manager if that's one of the things that you want to do. So the idea that your returns are your gross yield is ludicrous. And yet, the people who publish that are trying to be useful, but they're actually throwing you a head fake because they're saying that that's the return, but it's not, all right? It ends up being in the correct range, but it's for all the wrong reasons. Yield, net yield, what you actually take home is your gross yield minus your operating expenses and that gives you something called your net operating income or NOI. And by the way, we may have people here that are like, Greg, we know this, all right, but you know, you're hearing it <laughs> through another voice right now. A lot of people don't know the, the, the professional metrics that I'm sharing with you right now. Your expenses will wind up being all in 35 to 40% of the total rent. So I have it fit in at 35% right here. So $6,300 is what it's gonna wind up costing me to operate this property. My taxes, my insurance, my property management, my maintenance. I put money aside. I take 10% of my rent 
every month and set it aside in a side account. So when the air conditioner breaks, because it will, I just write a check out of that side account. I don't freak out, right? So I'm actually making $11,700 a year on my $200,000 investment. And so I, if I divide 11,700, my actual profit, by my price, I get 5.9%. That's my net yield. Okay, that's my net yield. Now, if I did a Google search of ROI in real estate, I would be able to show you a lot of people stop right there. They say, well, that's it. So that's my return. But it's not your return because the house should become more valuable. There's only been one time in history that nationwide home prices came down. Literally one time in history, and that was 10 years ago during the housing crisis. Prior to that, it had been a steady, gradual incline, recessions, booms, busts of the overall economy, the housing market, when a recession hits, usually just flattens out. Because housing is not tied to the overall economy as much as it's tied to population growth. So population growth doesn't, doesn't change because it's a recession. It doesn't tend to anyway. All right. Um, so the data indicates that this whole idea of up and down, up and down, up and down isn't really true. The reality is, is that the market generally goes up at a rate of about 3.5% a year, um, on average, over a very long period of history. And so when you buy real estate, you want to make a yield. If you're going to buy rental property, you want to generate a yield, but you also are going to get some price appreciation. So in this case, I've got a 2.1% estimate for home price appreciation on my, my uh, table here, which gives me an ROI of 8%. All right, so my $200,000 house, if it was worth 2% more next year, that would be worth 200 and what? Let's see, uh, 204,000. I can't do math in my head. Um, but it would be worth a little bit more than 200,000, plus I would get the net yield, so I'd have an ROI of eight. And so the question that I would ask people is does a house, in this case, it's in the Charlotte area, does a house in the Charlotte area feel like a stable investment to me? The answer to me, for me, is yes, okay? I feel very, very confident that a single family home in a good school district, in a good city where the migration is strong, population growth is strong. I have good property management. I work for the company. They're a great property management company. So I feel really confident that I'm going to keep the place occupied, generating income. Um, but I think it's going to do better than 2.1%. And let me show you that because this is where it gets fun. I'm going to jump over to renderswarehouse.com. And what I'm going to show you is I have the ability, and so do you, to open a free account on renderswarehouse.com in the investor marketplace and to load properties in either that you already own or that you're considering buying. All right? And very shortly, it's going to get even better and easier. But for now, you have to load properties in. And so this little portfolio you're looking at here of two houses, these are the two houses I just bought. All right? Cute little three-bedroom houses in a great rental neighborhood. And... Um, it shows them on the map and it shows that if I zoom out, I'll give you a moment to understand why I did this. So here's Charlotte. Okay, I live an hour away from these properties. Why didn't I buy up here where I live? Because something special is going on in this trajectory. You look around the greater Charlotte area and usually metro areas look like this, right? They have a highway ring around them and as you get further away, the population gets less and less dense and the prices tend to go down, right? But different suburbs around the market will tend to develop at different paces. So for example, south of the city, 40 minutes or 30 minutes due south, a house will be worth $350,000, same as north of the city. But if you go northeast up to Concord, it's worth like 220. If you go west to Gastonia right here, it's like 175, right? So of all the different towns around Charlotte, the Western trajectory has appreciated more slowly. The reason is Gastonia, the town was a little bit more beat up, all right, it needed to get gentrified. Some of that is happening right now. But a couple of other things are very interesting. This Western trajectory, I think Gastonia is going to catch up to Concord and the other towns. And all you have to do if you're doing the research to pick winners is just check out the prices. And then go check out the towns. Actually, go drive around. Get a feel for what you see when you're there. Do the places look like they're turning around, like in Gastonia right now? You're going to see a lot of stores are vacant, and they say for rent. But just a year ago, they said for sale. Okay, I've been watching for a while. They were for sale, and they were beat up. Now they've been purchased 
by investors. They've been fixed up and now they're for rent. So those investors who've bought up most of Main Street Gastonia, they believe that something good is happening. And so they think coffee shops and breweries and retail stores are going to be clamoring to go into this town. I see stuff like that. I pay close attention. I want to try to understand why. Let me give you some of the why. Right here, just west of the city, right here by my cursor, is the airport. And right next to the airport, Amazon is building a distribution center. And it's a monster. It looks like a mall when you drive by it with no windows and no doors. And in a way, it is a mall but you don't get to go inside, right? It's a mall that has all the products, but you order it on the website, on the app, and they bring it to you. 2,500 jobs, average income of the employees is gonna be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 grand, perfect renters. And so Gastonia, in a lot of ways, is preparing for all those jobs that you know people are gonna be able to commute 20 minutes to the Amazon facility, which is right here. But I didn't go there, I went to Belmont. Why did I go to Belmont? Let me zoom in this way and show you something special that I want to encourage you to try to find stuff like this. So here's Belmont, very quaint little town. I'll drop you right in the middle of it here so you get a sense of what it looks like when you're here. Okay, perfect, right? Cute little town, quaint. And right down here is where the magic's going to be happening because right over here, they're putting a train station. Okay, and that train station is going to commute, is going to be for commuters. It's going to be light rail, and it's going to be like 13 minutes to downtown Charlotte, right along this little trailway. So I looked around Belmont, and this neighborhood up here was $350,000. This one was 300. This one was 300. This one over here, 200. So I went and bought two houses in this neighborhood. I'm going to buy everything I can in and around this neighborhood. I've been stockpiling cash for a little while now, waiting for the opportunity to pounce on something that I thought was gonna be an outsized return. And if I can walk, I look at, if I dropped you in that neighborhood, you're gonna see that it's not exactly pretty yet. Now this is actually a pretty cute little section. But as you go down through this neighborhood, there are some parts between downtown and this neighborhood that are a little bit ugly. I'm going to zoom you all the way so you can see it. All right, so this mill, for example. All right, this burnt out, busted out mill. All right, but here's the thing here. This mill that looks like it's a, it's a disaster area has been purchased and is being rebuilt. And what it's going to be is restaurants and shops and a theater. So what I did here is I found a couple of things. One, I found a town that's in the right trajectory for a great, so I got a great state of North Carolina, sucking population from New York, DC, Boston, Chicago, everything cold and dense. North Carolina is awesome. Charlotte's awesome. Big population sucker, right? Pulling population in, pulling jobs in. So, but I don't want to stop there because I don't want the 8%. I want to do better than that, all right? So I look for a trajectory that has an advantage. Then within that, and that, that should be good enough for me, but it's not. I want to try to do better. So I dig in a little more. And here's what, if I go to the financials tab, see up here, I'm on the map. If I go to the financials, it has both of these properties combined into one little portfolio. And it shows that, you know, almost 6% return, the almost 8% return. So this kind of reflects what I showed you on the spreadsheet a moment ago. And it shows here the 2.1% appreciation rate. That is a 20 year average for Gaston County. I don't buy that 2.1%, all right? So I actually think it's gonna be five. And so now, what was just shy of an 8% return is actually just shy of an 11. That's picking winners, all right? And you can go all around the country and you can find examples of things like this. This is not magical or unique, I should say. It is magical, but it's not unique. It's pretty typical that you can go around different parts of the country um, and find examples of a great city, but within there, you turn over some rocks and you try to find examples of where, and you watch for things, right? You watch for things like Starbucks going into a town that's getting turned around. Starbucks does a lot of research. They've gotta know that some hipsters are gonna pay seven bucks for a cup of coffee before they sign a lease in that town. So you'll see towns that never had a Starbucks that all of a sudden get, get one. You'll see towns that never had a Home Depot or a Lowe's that all of a sudden get one. Right? That's a 99-year commitment that they're making when they put one of those stores in. 
right? You can piggyback on somebody else's research. You can show up and start reading. Like one of the things that I love to do, here's a great example. All right, I'm looking at Google right here and I search, um, give me a city, uh, Houston City Council approves, and I stop. Approves heavily amended $5 billion budget. Approves laying off. Ooh, that's not a good one. Usually, so this is not one that I would jump all over, but if I say city of Chattanooga, which is one of my favorite little towns that's coming on strong, approves fiscal, fiscal year budget, approves budget, narrowly approves business improvement district, okay? You dig into these kind of things. I set up alerts on a whole bunch of different towns that I want to keep my eye on, and I do the, the, the Google alert, the name of the town, the city of blank, or the county of blank, or the town of blank approves. I did city of Belmont approves. Train station showed up in my inbox. I knew the day that it happened, and I made the commitment shortly thereafter to start buying those properties. I wanted to wait until after it was approved, but before it was built. Does that make sense? So if I go in here, I just change my perspective, and let me show you the way that plays out, because we have calculators on here that show you how your cash flow grows over time from your baseline today, and how your equity grows. So I'm gonna bring this back to 2.1 and just illustrate for you. So this is gonna generate for me $23,000 a year, these two properties, 23 grand a year in income. And if I assume that my rents are gonna increase by 2% a year, and my expenses will increase by 1% a year, and my property value will increase by 2.1, I can look out 10 years, and I think in terms of 10 years, 10 years from now, my income that's right now 23,000 will be 28. Okay, that's cool, right? If, however, I feel more confident that because I can walk to a train station, I can increase my rents a little more, I'm gonna change my income um, rental increase to 3%. All right, and now my chart changed, and now 10 years from now, instead of 28,000, I've got 32. And what if I assume that, you know, listen, rents are going up four or 5% in a lot of parts of the country, and these are not places that, the number of houses that you can walk to a commuter train station to get into Charlotte in 13 minutes, is only like 100 houses you can do that. So I might get 4%. All right, now in 10 years, my income is 39.9. I went from 23 to $40,000 in income in 10 years. And then if I go over here, and instead of 2.1%, I get what I think I'm gonna get, which is 5% appreciation. Oh, I, let me go back, 2.1. 10 years later, my $400,000 in purchase price will be 478. Nothing to shake a stick at, but I'm gonna do better than that, I'm pretty sure, so I'm going to five. And now it's 616, it's a big difference, right? So this ROI is much, much stronger because I just took a little bit of extra energy to try to find those pockets. Now, I'll make the point to you that I am not the kind of person that, I mean, I have a hammer, but I don't know how to swing it, okay? I don't, I use this to intimidate my employees. <laughs> I, I, don't, um, I don't feel comfortable buying houses that are all beat up and fixing them up. I know that every TV show about real estate investing is all about flipping, which I don't do, and it's all about um, finding a house that's falling apart, fixing it up. I don't do any of that. I don't like doing any of that. That's not the way that I choose to find value. I choose to find value in the ways that I've been talking about here. Okay, so both of the homes that I purchased and then the kind of homes that we recommend, I didn't wanna make this about me, but I'd, I'd like for you to know that I'm putting my money where my mouth is here. Um, and you can do the same in terms of finding the places that are going to do better because of very simple demand factors. Demand. If demand increases and supply is limited, you're going to see an increase in value. You're going to see an increase in demand for rents. So you can charge more rents. And supply of walkable to the train station is extremely limited. Uh, and the demand, I think, is going to be off the charts. And so that's why I'm going to win with this investment. So the question then becomes, how do you go about looking around where you live um, or the country and getting a feel for what kind of ROI you can find? And I'll give you a quick little demo and then I'll let you go about your weekend. Um, and by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in and I'll, uh, I'll try to answer them. But if I go to the investor marketplace on renterswarehouse.com and click search our inventory, 
Right now, what you're gonna see is just the properties that we have listed. In about three weeks, you're gonna see a million properties because we're listing every property on the multiple listing service in all of our markets on this system and putting all those ROI metrics against them. So you can search all over the country um, for properties that are, would make great investment properties and do this comparison. But if I scroll down here, I can bounce around. I can look at Austin, Texas, for example. And just to go real quick, so here's Austin, Texas, properties for sale. And if I go into my financials on that, I'm gonna see, oop, I'm missing a data point here. What is wrong with my chart? Oh, I remember now. Okay, so uh, Hayes County, Texas does not report this data very accurately. They're a little bit shut mouth there about it. So I'm gonna go back and give you an assumption instead. Austin, Texas is a great city. Right now, our calculator shows no appreciation rate. I think it's going to be a five, okay? So at face value, these properties in Austin, I believe, are a 10.2. And what I maybe didn't say before is anything north of a 10, I define that as a winner, all right? So what, now what's cool about Austin? Austin is um, the blue city in the red state. What does that mean, okay? It is the state capital of Texas. Uh, Texas is a very well-run state from the fiscal perspective, right? They don't spend all the money. Um, they have a surplus and they keep it pretty tight. Austin is the university-driven, cool, young, hip town. It's the blue city in the red state. So it's the capital. So it has the anchor of the government and it has the anchor of the university base and it has the anchor of tourism and cool hipness and it attracts youth from all over the country, all over the world, but it's in a red state. So I like government cities, but I don't like them as much in blue states because like New York, Albany, Sacramento, California, the anchor in those cities is the state government, but somebody eventually is going to get elected who's going to slash the government in those states because they're going to go bankrupt otherwise. That makes me nervous. It's going to erode jobs. Raleigh? Blue City, Red State. Austin, Blue City, Red State. Both of those places have big university bases, a lot of youth, and they are appreciating at a faster pace than other markets. The yields aren't as high, but I think they're winners because of core demand factors, right? I go back over here again to the map. Um, I go to Dallas. Dallas is interesting. Another Texas city. All right, I go to the financials on this portfolio. And I'm seeing is a relatively low yield, 4.4%, which is a little bit low for Dallas. So these are probably slightly higher priced properties. No, they're not. Maybe they're just overpriced properties. Um, but I've got a 4.47% appreciation rate on this. If I go to my market data, I can see the depiction of that chart showing over 20 years. Okay. So the blue line is the USA. Here's the housing boom. Here's the housing bust. Here's the recovery. And then here's Dallas. And you can see it's had a really, really, really strong run in the last couple of years. All right. And it's been putting up some pretty good numbers, 4.5% appreciation rate. I'm going to go someplace different now for you. If I were to go to Arkansas. All right. Arkansas, not on the tip of anybody's tongue in terms of a place you'd think to invest. Look at the prices of these houses, $40,000, $45,000, okay? So the yields on them are likely to be higher, okay? 8.7% yield instead of the fours and the fives you've been looking at, but only practically a flat appreciation. So it goes to a nine. But isn't that interesting? I was telling you how it winds up being between eight and 10 at face value. So here's a market, if I show you the chart, flat line and one this is a bad data point right here basically a flat line of appreciation over the last 20 years it really hasn't gone anywhere but because of that simple fact the yields are better because yield is how much rent are you profiting compared to what you pay when the house prices are low the yield's going to be high so even though there's basically no appreciation i still made my way to nine percent isn't that interesting so i get there in austin with a 5% yield and a 4% appreciation, I get there in Arkansas with a 9% yield and no appreciation, right? I am such a nerd on housing investment that I'm like, I'm as excited here as like, <laughs> as can be. Because I don't, 
I don't, I'm not as close to these things, but I didn't know what to expect when I opened up some of these. Denver, Colorado. I do know what to expect. I know it's going to land between 8 and 10. So where's the winner in Denver? All right? The financials in Denver. Let's look at the market data first. Look at the home price chart first. Look at that chart. All right? Denver was steady as she goes. The green line, which is Denver County, was tracking right along the state of Colorado and kind of right along with uh, the national line. But when the housing bust came, it barely registered and then it kept going. And then it got steeper. Right? Now, the appreciation rate is 8.8% over the last 20 years. That is insane. So the question somebody might ask is, well, is this going to keep going? So what is going on in Denver that would cause it to be so strong? And the answer is, when you ask people in 2012, when I recommended Denver in a big way before this big run, so I was right about that. It's the reason why I have this job is that I've made a number of really good picks over the years that seemed obvious to me, but apparently weren't as obvious to other people. I called this run early. It was because I spent time there and I saw the lifestyle being so spot on with the way people are living these days. And the millennial generation wanting to be, they want to go hiking, they want to go skiing, they want to live outdoors or not live outdoors. They want to breathe fresh air, spend time outdoors. The kind of things that Denver and the surrounding area is famous for was a really phenomenal fit for the population that was coming into the home ownership and the investing age bracket, okay? Then they embraced the cannabis business. Now, I don't know how you feel politically about legalization of cannabis, and it doesn't matter, okay? Because it's a beast of an industry. It has moved into Colorado because Colorado's government decided to embrace it. Other states were thinking about it. Colorado didn't think about it. Colorado jumped on it, all right? Um, and again, you don't know how I feel about it. doesn't matter how I feel about it. I'm telling you that I think it means that Denver is going to keep growing at an outrageously good pace because that's a very big business. And when industries set up shop, they lay down roots. They make very, very big permanent investments. Other states, like Southern California has entertainment. New York has finance. Detroit used to have autos getting it back. Colorado has cannabis. They laid claim to it. I think it's going to keep going well. So I go over to market data, I'm sorry, over to financials, and this particular portfolio is only yielding that you know, high five, six percent, but with the appreciation rate, this is a 15% ROI. That's among the best in the country. That's a winner, all right? But the big question for a lot of people is, that's great, Greg, Denver already happened. What's the next pick? Well, <clears throat> and I'll leave you with this. My favorite thing to do is to pick the winners, but also pick the ones that are coming next. And it's become very interesting to look at a place like Denver and say, what city near Denver is coming on strong but hasn't hit yet? All right, so it's like Denver. It has the same fundamentals as Denver, but it's just behind. What is like Dallas, but is behind Dallas? What is like Nashville, but is behind Nashville? What's like Charlotte, but is behind? And the answers are, Columbia is behind Charlotte, Oklahoma City is behind Denver, Chattanooga is behind Nashville, and Colorado Springs is behind Denver. Did I say Denver? I think I said Denver twice. Oklahoma City is behind Dallas. So Oklahoma City is the next Dallas, I believe. Colorado Springs is, a, is the kid brother of Denver, Chattanooga, and Columbia. Those are my picks for, for the rising markets coming to be. We have somebody on Instagram who asked a question. Hey, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm 30 years old and just now learning a lot about passive income with rental properties. Say if you had 60 grand of your own money to start with, where would you start? Okay, so Chris, thank you for watching. Um, if I had $60,000 in my pocket, which I happen to have 60 grand in my pocket. If I had 60,000 in my pocket, where would I be investing? He's from Birmingham. There is nothing wrong with Birmingham. Let me show you some stuff there. When I was talking a moment ago about, you know, what is the next Nashville, I feel like Alabama is the next Georgia. Okay, they're sitting right next to each other. Georgia took off like crazy with Atlanta as the anchor. Mississippi, Alabama, Kentucky, uh, Arkansas, Oklahoma are developing more slowly from Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, Tennessee. All right, but they have a lot of the same fundamentals. So I'm, literally I'm talking 20, 25 years behind. But I think in terms of 20 or 25 year 
investment thresholds. And so that's fine with me, right? Birmingham is a market where the appreciation is very little, all right? I learned a lot when I was down there recently. First of all, I learned that um, I already knew that the auto industry is calling Alabama its second home to Detroit, okay? So Huntsville, Alabama, an hour away from Birmingham is on fire because they're getting these auto factories. But Birmingham is starting to attract businesses coming into the market. So when you have yields in Birmingham that are fairly high because the prices are fairly low, this one's not a great example. The yields are actually very average, but you can do better than this in Birmingham. You can get a 7% yield and you're going to get to nine with a 7% yield and a 2% appreciation. But if you lock down the 7% yield and what I think is happening continues to happen, I think we're going to get three and a quarter, three and a half percent appreciation in Birmingham over the next 10 years. And you're going to see that 10%. So if you've got $60,000, what I would do with it is I would break that in half and I would make a $30,000 down payment on one property and a $30,000 down payment on another property. Two properties at $110,000, $120,000 each. Put a healthy down payment down, buy two houses, rent them out for a profit, and hang on to them. Whatever you did, it sounded like you were a young guy, whatever you did to save that 60 grand, keep doing it, right? Just keep doing it. Um, and then buy two more and then buy two more. One of the things I learned about Birmingham when I visited because it makes a lot of sense to put boots on the ground, and the fact that you're there is a good thing, right? You're, you're gonna be able to babysit your investments better by being close by, is I asked people, um, I got a vibe that the attitude in Alabama in general, I heard about it on the waterfront, I heard about it in Birmingham, this idea that they don't want Yankees showing up down there. Like, they're, they're, they're perfectly fine to be the best kept secret. The Alabama waterfront, is like the most beautiful beach in America. And they don't want me telling you that. I literally heard that years ago and I heard it since. Like, no, 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 you wouldn't like it. Go to Florida. Go to Florida, Yankee, <laughs> right? So um, they have an attitude that says, we're a very well-kept secret and we like it that way. Okay, the brand of Birmingham has not been great, right? It's not considered to be a big mecca of business, but that's changing. They literally told me that companies like Dave & Buster's, the, the r big restaurant, it's like a big uh, arcade restaurant in one, they got turned down when they wanted to open a Birmingham location. So why would you turn down Dave & Buster's? And the answer was they don't like chains. There's a cultural thing that says, let's just keep it the way it is. We don't need it to get crowded. We don't want a bunch of grumpy Northeasterners coming down here, right? That's their attitude. But it's changing. The secret's getting out. The prices are low. The quality of life is strong. The cost of living is low. The jobs are starting to move in because companies like going places where they can get phenomenal tax breaks. So my advice to Chris, it was Chris? Uh, yeah. My advice to Chris is to um, stay put. Okay, maybe check out Huntsville. It's an hour away, but they've got the auto industry. If you literally buy property for auto workers to rent from you, you've got it locked down. Be as close as you can to where those people have to go to work. People like to commute a couple of miles to work. The supply of that experience is limited, right? Makes sense. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that we, we've been talking a lot about the snowball strategy. So when it's a young guy, the snowball strategy of real estate investing means that you buy the first place and you live in it. And then you live there for a few years and then you don't sell it, you move out, you buy another place, you rent the first place out, live there for a few years, move out, go to the next one, and you use your own, you, you need to pay for housing. Okay, so you can leverage your housing expense by basically buying properties that then become investment properties. Another advantage of the snowball is that you can buy and get a home ownership mortgage, which right now are like 4%. The best mortgages out there are people that are going to buy it and live there. Okay, even if you plan to move out and rent it out in the future, you're not committing any kind of bank fraud. As long as you intend to move in when you buy it, you can get a home ownership mortgage, a super duper low rate live there for a couple of years, go to the next one. Uh, I'll add one more cherry on top of that, and that is if you can buy a two-family or a three-family house in Birmingham, three apartments. Let's say there's a nice one upstairs, a little bit less, you know, there's a three, just a two-family. There's a three-bedroom house upstairs and a basement apartment, one family, one, one bedroom downstairs. You're a young guy, live in the crappier of the two apartments. Rent out the three-bedroom to a family. Now you're in your first home, you're probably not paying anything for your housing expense at all, all right? Because you got somebody renting a three-bedroom upstairs. They're probably paying the whole mortgage, 
right? Because you live there, you still get to get that good mortgage. Live there for a few years, move out from there. You're going to be able to save money even faster because you have virtually no or even a profitable housing experience. You move out, keep the two family, do it again. Next time you buy the two family, you live in the nicer one because maybe you're getting married and you're going to have kids. Rent the other one out. Now you're getting your, your housing expense subsidized by a tenant. Move on, keep it. Think in terms of however old you are now, when you're 55 years old, how many houses do you want to have? And start pacing that out. Because if you're 55 and you've got 10 or 15 or 20 houses and they're paid down or they're paid off, you only go to work because you like it, all right? Not because you have to. Because you're not only, because the, the beauty, and this is what I'll close with, the, oh, we have a couple of questions, I'll go to those. The, the beauty of this asset class is that all the things I said about the demand, but the fact that it generates current income for you and it gets more valuable over time, okay? Even if there's a dip, which there's only been one, but if that happened again, if you ride it out, you can ride it out. The income from the tenant allows you to ride out the storm. So just you know, keep your head and ride it out. The, the existence of income and wealth creation through appreciation is unmatched anywhere else. And so back to the thoughts in the beginning, all that's true, but it's hard. We're just making it a lot easier for you. Minneapolis, St. Paul. Yes, Sunday. What a cool name. I'm sorry I was talking up Friday when your name is Sunday. I should have done this webinar on Sunday. Um, Twin Cities. Let me jump over there. Very interesting. The Twin Cities have been coming on very strong of late in terms of the professional investors that we deal with. They have been getting... All of a sudden, like so the big Wall Street investors that we deal with they have not been interested in Minnesota yet. Okay, I don't think I think there's only one of them that I know of of the 20 that we served. I mean, big. Like, these are companies that have five, 10, 20,000 houses. They weren't doing Minnesota, but all of a sudden it started to percolate. People were started talking about it. I think we have a couple of properties for sale. Renters Warehouse is, is headquartered in Eden Prairie in Minnesota. So here's some examples. All right. So what you're going to find in Minnesota is the appreciation has been strong. The, therefore, the yield is a little bit lower. The rents don't tend to keep up with prices. So as prices get higher and rents get higher, but not as quickly, the yields get compressed. And so here's an example of a house. Purchase price is 230000 So you have to see that the, the yield is only 4%, but the appreciation rate is 4 as well. Okay, so it gets you pushing 9, just like I said before. I go to that market data tab and you can see the chart. Interesting chart. So check this out. So here's the last 20 years of the average priced home in Scott County, Minnesota. All right, you see it went up higher and stronger than the rest of the country. It came down pretty hard, so you had a, a pretty healthy housing correction also. Then it fought its way back, all right? Now, what I found interesting, this is a good time to point this out. Usually when you see a housing price chart, it's not choppy like this, right? You don't see this kind of a heartbeat happening. And the reason is most people who do housing data I think they want to show how smart they are because they say, well, this is adjusted for inflation. This is seasonally adjusted. This data is not adjusted for anything. It is not seasonally adjusted. It is not adjusted for inflation. So if I went and showed you the peaks, July, the trough, December, peak. Well, this is a little bit off. The peaks and troughs usually correspond with winter and summer. This is kind of all over the map, though. But you usually will find that in the coldest months, okay, February, February. I was in Minnesota in February this year when it was 27 below before the wind chill. You know what I'm talking about, right, Sunday? February. It, the prices in Minneapolis are cheapest in the coldest months. Why? Well, it's obvious, right? Everyone knows that the spring market is the time when the market's hottest. Every realtor you meet will tell you spring market's hotter and then the you know, winter months not so much. But they never tell you how much hotter. Look at the difference here. Average price 250, average price 180, average price 240, average price 237. Look at the peak in the trough on this. It's a big swing. So what does that mean? Does it mean that people only buy cheaper houses in the winter? No. What it means is when it's that cold out, two things. There's a seasonality of Christmas, the holidays, etc. Okay, Thanksgiving through New Year's Eve is very lean in the home sale business. People are busy with other things, right? 
Um, when it's also 27 below, they're busy with other things like not dying on the side of the highway, right? So the combination of being really cold and people being distracted, February numbers are based on transactions that were negotiated in December. Don't forget, it takes time to close a deal. So that's all wintertime activity. Uh, plus the springtime, people, it's nicer out. They come out of their shells and they want to get into a new house during the summer so they're ready for the new school year, right, in the new school. So that means that if you're a home buyer, you tend to want to buy in the spring and summer for reasons that are important to you. If you're an investor, you don't care about that. So if you're an investor, if it were me, I would be thinking about waiting until the fourth quarter to buy because I could be among less buyers. The demand is suppressed in that time of the year. And so the sellers that actually, because there's less demand, the buyers have less competition, they offer lower prices, and the sellers that have to sell accept the offer. The sellers that have the flexibility to be able to wait until the spring, well, they wait until the spring. That makes sense? So because you're among a, a, a softer demand, the supply that needs to get a transaction done and sell accepts the best offer they can get, and it tends to be, in this case, tens of thousands of dollars less than it would have been uh, if you bought that house in um, you know, May or June. Okay, I like Minnesota because of what I've learned. I spent a lot of time there since Renders Warehouse bought my company. I've gotten to know the people. I understand the whole Minnesota nice thing now. Um, but I've also learned is that sometimes Minnesota nice means I smile on your face and then I want to give you an ice pick in the ear when you're not looking because <laughs> the, the, the passive aggressive thing is real. Um, but no, it's genuinely, it's a nice place. The people that live there, and I'm sure you'd probably reinforce this, they really like it. I know people that I work with that left and came running back because they really like it. The people are part of the culture. The way it is right now, this time of year, is so gorgeous it defies description. Uh, and you put up with the winter and you love your sports, right? The population growth is very strong. It's very, very stable. People don't tend to leave. And we're starting to see some investor interest from some of the Wall Street guys and gals. And that's a little bit like watching Starbucks open, an, open a shop or Home Depot or Lowe's open a store. When Wall Street firms start making their way to a new market, they know something. Okay, I know it too. It's a major metro. It's got big job potential. People that go there want to stay. The quality of life is awesome, even if it's too cold in the, in the uh, wintertime. And with that, we're coming up on an hour. So thank you very much for being here. Hope you liked it. Bye-bye.